Okay. Uh, so I'd like to motivate my talk today in development of the, uh, the Coastal Community Landscape Evolution Model, also named CASCADE. I did a bad job Googling the acronym before I named my model. Uh, but I'd like to motivate the, the talk and development with some recent news from the North Carolina Outer Banks. So this is an image of Pea Island. Uh, it is a low line barrier island in the North Carolina Outer Banks. Uh, at the, the south end of this, this photo or at the bottom is Rodanthe. Uh, I'm gonna use this mouse. So this is Rodanthe. There is no mouse. Okay. Uh, just north of Rodanthe, there's a stretch of roadway that's really vulnerable to storm impacts. It's frequently overwashed. And uh, NCDOT has decided to bypass this region with a large bridge and connect farther up the barrier island where it's slightly thicker. But why this made headlines this week? Is for this reason. There was a home that fell into the ocean and this made global headlines. This is the second home that fell into the ocean this year. And it's a pretty gnarly video. Um, we were looking at it yesterday and thinking, oh, it, we hope the door doesn't open and somebody's in there. And it was evacuated beforehand, but it, it struck a lot of conversation. So these were two, uh, two news articles that, that I found. Uh, the first one, North Carolina house collapses. Climate change is a real thing. Uh, the Outer Banks Beach house collapse won't impact your summer vacation though. And on Twitter, there's been a lot of discussions. This one on the right, uh, why is it so hard to move or demolish oceanfront houses before the Atlantic finally comes for them? And Jessica Whitehead, Whitehead uh, used to work for the North Carolina Office of Resilience and Recovery. And she said, hint, it's a policy and economics problem. It's not a hazard risk deficit or information deficit problem. And what I would argue is that it's a policy economics and a coupled landscape change problem. So we know that coastal risks are increasing uh, due to sea level rise, storms, uh, shoreline erosion, but so are the housing prices. So this plot in the upper left shows the last 10 years of housing prices in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. We had two really large hurricanes, devastating hurricanes during this period, Hurricane Florence, and Hurricane Dorian. They made little bumps in, in these trends, but the prices are still going up. And just this last year, the most expensive home in the state listed for 13.9 million in Wrightsville Beach along the Intracoastal Waterway. And that's what I'm showing on the right. And this is in an area that previously flooded. So why are housing prices increasing? It's because markets are dynamically linked to the coastal environment. So looking at this feedback loop, starting with the left, large tax revenues and high value of infrastructure necessitates that we manage the coast and necessitates that we remove overwash from roadways to access communities and that we nourish beaches, that we, we build larger dunes. And these environmental characteristics are what help maintain property values. With more properties at risk, we construct larger dunes, more dunes, and continue to nourish. And the cycle goes on perpetually forever. What we're interested in, my colleagues and I, is what will happen to this feedback loop when landforms change with climate impacts, sea level rise, and storms? So to look at that question, we needed a new, a new model, a new coupled model that could simulate uh, coastal management actions to protect roadways, to protect communities, and how those management actions and the changes uh, to landforms impact coastal real estate markets. So that new coupled model is, like I said, Cascade, the Coastal Community Landscape Evolution Model. And it is really a series of coupled models. At the heart of Cascade is Barrier 3D, it's a quasi 3D exploratory model of barrier evolution. Uh, it was developed by Ian Reeves at UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, the, the uh, domain on the right is the barrier 3D domain. 
This model simulates the effects of sea level rise, dune growth, storm overwash, shoreline change, and a dynamic shore based response on barrier evolution over decades. Uh, barrier 3D is coupled with Brie. Brie is the barrier inlet environment model. It was developed by Yap Nienhaus and uh, Jorge Lorenzo Dueba. And we use Brie specifically for a longshore sediment transport to connect our individual barrier 3D models. So that's our, our natural barrier coupled model framework is, is this top loop. Uh, at the bottom are our human dynamics modules. We manage the roadways and the, the roadway manager. We manage beaches and dunes and the beach and dune manager. And then we have Seahome, uh, the coastal home ownership model. And this is an agent-based model. And I'll describe each of these uh, in turn in the next few slides. So first, roadways. We manage roadways by first initializing a roadway in the barrier 3D domain. So this is just a cross section at, uh, of the, the 3D barrier 3D domain. We initialize the roadway. And as the dune migrates towards the roadway, uh, we continue to remove overwash. We place it back on the dune, just like our DOT does in North Carolina. And we do this until the dune threatens the roadway. And then we relocate the roadway into the interior at the elevation of the barrier. So this is how we manage roads. We stop management when the road can't be relo relocated. And that's shown on the image on the right where there's just wetlands. There's no land for the roadway to be relocated to or when 20% of the roadway touches water. Beach and dune management is a little bit more complex. We uh, nourish the shore face and the beach. We filter overwash for the effect of homes and commercial properties, meaning we don't even allow it to be placed on top of the barrier. And for what is actually placed on the barrier, uh, like I'm showing in, in this image on the right, we remove some of the overwash and put it back on the dunes. Uh, we also don't allow the dunes to migrate. We want this front line of homes shown on the image on the left to stay there. We're trying to protect those homes. And we rebuild dunes after storms. We stop management of a community when the barrier becomes too narrow to sustain a community. And uh, we use information from Nags Head, North Carolina, as a minimum community width of 50 meters. This is just a home plus a roadway. So a barrier can get really narrow. Okay, and then our final coupled model, and I, I should mention, this is not just model coupling, this has also been a lot of model translation from MATLAB to Python. Um, so a couple of slides ago, I had the, the systems logo on the bottom right, and we worked really closely with Eric Hutton, who's in the back of the room, uh, to translate these models and, and couple them together. So uh, real estate and policy interventions are included within CHOME, this agent-based model. And we supply agents in this model with environmental variables. And these agents can make decisions about purchasing real estate. So this is what CHOME looks like. It was developed by my colleagues, uh, Zach Williams, Dylan McNamara, and Marty Smith. And this is Zach and I debugging CHOME all last week. So we have results to show you today. So within this model, an agent is a potential homeowner that is trying to decide whether or not they want to rent or buy at the beach. Each of these agents have their own risk preference, their own wealth characteristics, uh, desires to live at the coast, and expectations about the market in the future. Uh, mathematically, an agent is just this equation on the right. It's a bid function. It includes uh, functions that encapsulate the effects of beach width and erosion rate on perceptions, sea level rise, barrier elevation, uh, the frequency of storms, how often nourishment is going to happen and uh, what the expected beach width might be in the future. Okay, so towards the results. Uh, the in initial conditions for Cascade are uh, drawn from simulations that were parameterized for the Virginia Coastal Reserve. Uh, we're going to use high and low topographies that I'm showing in the bottom left. And these were developed for different dune growth rates. 
Within Cascade, storms add stochasticity. So here in the slides that follow, I'm just going to show one set of storms over 200 years. And I'm going to apply two different rates of sea level rise. The first one is four millimeters per year. And the second is an accelerated case. Um, and that's shown by the black line on the lower right. So Cascade is an exploratory model. It's not meant to simulate specific barrier dynamics, but rather look at general behaviors. So in motivation uh, of the PI lane case, I wanted to make something that looks sort of similar. On the left, this is our initial uh, Cascade domain. We have a community that has commercial properties. It's high and wide. It's connected to a roadway that's also high and wide on the right side of the domain uh, by a really narrow and low barrier segment. So everything on the left is a community uh, or the, for the first 150 decameters. So notice that says dam in the bottom, that's decameters. And then on the right is all roadways. So here are two plan form views over time. Uh, the middle plot is after 190 years of simulation. The bottom is 199 years of simulation for the case of linear sea level rise, a really low rate. So in this scenario, the roadway wasn't abandoned for 190 years, which is a long time. And thereafter, there was a storm of sufficient strength uh, or size that allowed the dune that remained to be overwashed and the barrier quickly widened. So some takeaways from this, we're, we're mostly earth scientists, we're interested in, in landscape change. While both of these management actions, maintaining a community, maintaining roadways, act to narrow and lower the barrier. And we can see that through these landform views over time. Uh, something that's a little harder to see here without time series, but for the sake of time, if part of the barrier moves landward, for example, the roadway, the effects are felt on the along shore. And you begin to see these, these curved shapes of the barrier landscape because of that. And for a community that results in a more frequent need to nourish. But we're interested in real, estates today, or real estate markets today. So at what point in this simulation will real estate markets unravel? The first case that we're going to look at is if the government heavily subsidizes nourishment, a 90% subsidy. So the remaining 10% would be financed by local communities. Within uh, Sea Home, we assign an imaginary value to oceanfront homes and to uh, non-oceanfront homes. So for oceanfront homes, it's 500,000. For non-oceanfront homes, it's 400,000. And any time the price drops below that market, price, the pool of agent, agents becomes wealthier. Um, they, they buy up the cheaper real estate. And each of these oscillations is linked to a different nourishment, which I'm not showing here, nourishment and erosion. So another way to look at this, and I think this is more intuitive, is looking at the investor market share. So that's essentially the, the amount of renters that are in the market. Uh, so for the non-ocean front, for this, this landscape change scenario, we start with a lot of renters, upwards of 70%. And after 125 years uh, for non-ocean front properties, we have zero renters. Everybody that lives on the island is one of the wealthier agents that owns their home and is more tolerant of risk. So let's add some accelerated sea level rise. So here I've added uh, the red line, which is now the non-ocean front property for accelerated sea level rise and the green line, which is the ocean front uh, properties. And you can see that uh, it goes to zero a lot quicker after about 80 years. So this process of the wealthier agents coming in, driving out renters and investors is just, it happens faster with accelerated sea level rise. And you'll notice the red line stops at 80. And that's because the barrier actually drowns in the middle. So you'll see the timing now for the accelerated sea level rise scenario. 
of roadway abandonment is 84 years as opposed to 190 years. And thereafter, there's a lull in storms and sea level is rising so quickly. There's not a storm to come in and overwash the barrier that that, that middle barrier actually drowns uh, almost five years later or less than five years later. So the, the barrier community on the left becomes isolated and we don't account for this in our, our real estate model. So I ended the simulation there and I wanted to look at, okay, what happens if we choose a different uh, type of subsidy? What if we, as a, a government, only subsidize nourishment by 50%? We put a lot of the burden on communities to pay for it themselves. Uh, I've added here the brown line, which is the non-ocean front properties with a 50% subsidy and the purple line, which is the ocean front properties. And with this lower subsidy, there are more wealthy agents in the system from the start. And it's a much quicker drawdown to no renters in the system. So these lower subs subsidies counterintuitively exacerbate social inequalities. And so it's something, this was a, an interesting takeaway for us that there are social implications um, when coupled with these landscape changes uh, and, and policies to consider. So my takeaways, um, climate-driven changes to coastal landforms can unravel real estate markets. And there are complexities with uh, spatial variability with management, lower subsidies likely exacerbate social inequalities. And uh, I think this is an interesting demonstration of how we as earth scientists and earth surface process modelers can incorporate humans into our frameworks. So I was on the geomorph crew of this project. Uh, it's 10 years in the making. It took a long time to get this model up and running. Uh, the economics crew consisted of Zach, Marty, Dylan, and Satya, ec uh, economists, nonlinear dynamicists. So it was a really interdisciplinary crew and we had a lot of help from systems. So with that, I will take any questions. Thanks, that's really exciting work. Um, I'm curious, right now you've got the homeowners making purely economic decisions with some level of risk aversion. Are you giving any thought to more psychologically complex decision processes like theory of planned behavior or protection motivation theory? Ooh, I, I have not given really much thought to what the agents are thinking because I'm on the geomorph crew, but... Uh, that's a really interesting question. And I'm sure that Marty or Zach would um, have more thoughtful things to say, but in terms of the economic model and the what goes into it, um, it's empirically based. We, we sent out surveys or other members of our crew created surveys to try to understand risk perceptions. I, I imagine a psychological component to actually um, mathematically put that into our bid function, we would need data on that from people. Yes, we have uh, uh, some funding feelers out there to try to improve this model to include other social effects. Behaviors. So one of the paradoxes of, of the whole situation is that uh, homeowners with insurance can't use that insurance to move their house or, or to, to they, they can only get the insurance if the house is destroyed like your video. Is that something that could be added or could the cost of insurance be added to the economics? I know you don't know the economics, but is that something? Yeah, I'm sure it could. I, I think what is happening here, I mean, I think that would just drive out investors more Quickly, yeah, if we added that to the, the bid function, um, what's happening is that the risk, toler the, the risk to tolerance of wealthy agents is so much so that they don't care. They're willing to have or live at the coast no matter what, essentially within our framework. So 
I don't know if insurance would matter for them as much as investors. Uh, that was really interesting. With the coupled models, have you thought about keeping track of uncertainty of different elements on the geomorphic side and on the economics and human side? Tried to match that so that you're not being too precise in one area and way, yeah. Yeah, I think we can do that with more model runs. This is just one storm sequence, but if we do hundreds or a hundred was the plan, uh, storm sequences and then average, I think we can account for some uncertainties there and play with some of the different management variables. That was my thought. 